Good afternoon. We're just getting started here a few minutes late. Um, welcome, everybody. We have a very exciting next 60 minutes coming up here. The anatomy of a ransomware. We are going to uh, take a ransomware, dissect it, similar like you would dissect a frog to learn about the organs, but we are going to specifically learn about what ransomware is, uh, a little bit of history about it, how it infects your computer, and we're actually going to go through the motions of uh, infecting a computer and showing you the different stages of infection and the different uh, stages of the what we call the kill chain, which is places where you can actually block it and prevent it from infecting a computer. And today, we are extremely excited and lucky to have uh, some special guests here. Uh, so from uh, FishMe, Aaron Higby. Uh, Aaron has been in the security industry probably since he was born and uh, probably was born with a cape on his back already. Uh, I've known Aaron for some time and uh, anybody who knows him would probably say that uh, uh, Aaron is tr truly one of a kind when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, Aaron started uh, multiple companies currently at, at FishMe. He's the founder and CTO and he's considered to be one of the top uh, authorities on ransomware out there. Uh, we're excited to have you, Aaron. Welcome. Hey, thank you for that introduction, Andrew. Glad to be here today. Yep, absolutely, and thank you. And also, uh, Rob Ray uh, had a last-minute change, and he wasn't able to make it, but uh, he said he's going to send his, uh, his brightest and best, and absolutely he did. And we have uh, Dan Flanagan with us here today from uh, Datto. Hey, how are you? Glad to be here. You're great, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and uh, uh, just before we get started here, um, so we have quite a few attendees here. We're going to take some questions at the end of the session. Um, just a quick overview of the agenda. So we're going to start out with uh, with a with a good history of ransomware and a good understanding of it. Uh, so Aaron's going to go through and and give us some good details so that when we do the demo you'll be able to kind of follow along and understand what's going on each step of the way. So without further ado, Aaron, I'm going to turn this over to you. Sure, great. Thank you for that, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, what I'm going to do is I, I went ahead and put together a few different samples of ransomware. And what I wanted to do is really go f to over history so everyone in the audience can get an understanding of the evolution of the different families of ransomware and really at the pace of innovation that these crimeware authors are, are, are keeping up with as far as improving their tool set and that might give you an understanding of why this is such a big problem and why the problem continues to grow. Um, I don't think I can turn the news on recently without hearing about another disaster uh, related to ransomware. There have been a number of high profile ones that have hit the news uh, recently, um, we've had a hospital that was really just taken offline. They, they had their entire billing and accounting systems, their image recording systems uh, taken offline. And what was interesting about this particular one is this hospital decided to go ahead and pay the ransom, which for, for, the, for them they had about 40 systems that, that they needed to do that. And at the time, based on the price of the cryptocurrency, that, that equated to about $17,000. And what was interesting about this one is most of the time when a company is caught in a situation where they end up having to pay the ransom because they don't have any other choice, they usually do so quietly. Uh, but in this case, you can actually read a, a memo from their CIO and CEO about the ransomware and, and what they needed to do um, just by Googling Hollywood Presbyterian uh, ransomware memo. Um, unfortunately, this continues to hit other hospitals and other entities all across the nation. And for those that are unfamiliar with the term, what I'll, what I'll do for you is briefly explain it on a high level, and then we'll get down into some of the specific mechanics of some of the different ransomware families um, that have been active and that are currently active. So if you don't know what ransomware is, as, as the name implies, what happens is, and, and typically it's a result of employees in your organization clicking on a phishing email um, that contains malware that will infect their computer and 
what it'll end up doing is looking for documents. Usually it'll go through the desktop, it'll go through the My Documents store, and it'll begin encrypting those documents. And it will usually leave some sort of note, almost like a ransom note, that'll either be in the directory of the files and folders that were encrypted, or sometimes it will spawn some sort of pop-up window to let the victim know, hey, we've encrypted your files. If you want to decrypt them, this is what you need to do. And they'll either give them steps on how to decrypt the files right there in the ransom note, or sometimes it'll take them to an informational or, or help desk site that the threat actors put up that explain it. The earliest forms of ransomware actually wanted Western Union um, or, or MoneyGram or digital gold currency um, as far as payment. And so that was a bit of a a hang up for the attackers in the earliest days of, of ransomware campaigns. Most recently and the most prevalent method for payment now is to use a, a digital currency known as Bitcoin uh, in order to make the payment. It's anonymous for the attacker to receive it and they don't have to rely on someone going down and filling out a, a Western Union. So as, as the common practices for most ransomware families, um, they encrypt the files on the system They'll use something called the onion router or the dark net in order to communicate with the attacker's infrastructure. And what they're doing is um, that, you know, once you make the payment and they verified that, you're, the ransomware will receive a decryption key so it can begin to decrypt the files. Um, ransomware will usually try to make itself um, somewhat annoying. So it'll look for backups, uh, especially local uh, Windows snapshots and delete those. Uh, and oftentimes, um, ransomware is delivered by sort of off-the-shelf crimeware exploit kits. So a lot of people with <laughs> some time on their hands, they might not actually know how to code um, the ransomware capabilities, but they can go buy the kits and then launch their own campaigns um, so that they can get into this cybercrime business. Another thing that ransomware does is it will really try to wreak havoc by looking for network shares. And so in the early days, if you had a local file system on your office network and you had those drives mapped, um, you would, it would encrypt those files. Um, it'll also look for things that's attached via storage, so USB storage. But what's, what's interesting now here in the modern era is we have tools like OneDrive from Office, we have Google Drive, and a lot of these tools have ways to map themselves as local drives. And so ransomware is able to infect uh, systems that are mapped over a network or a cloud-based storage system too. So those are common practices for most of the families of ransomware. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is, is probably the most famous. I think this is the one that really got uh, 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 a lot of news coverage early on. Um, it's called CryptoWall and as the, the name implies it, it encrypts your files and it, it pretty much puts a firewall between you and your files. Um, it's persistent, so when you reboot the system, it would remain there. It would delete local file system snapshots, you know, because it, it didn't want you to try to recover your files. It's hoping that you don't have a backup strategy uh, in place. And it, it was the, probably the number one ransomware family that um, different researchers and people in the community would, would monitor over the years. In fact, if you look at the development of it, uh, we first saw it live in 2013. And as researchers found problems in the software, sometimes we could find back doors or we could look and you know, figure out problems with the encryption. Um, researchers would, would publish ways to, to clean crypto wall. The authors would read the same blog posts and they would increase the capabilities of the ransomware. So several versions of crypto wall came out. Uh, over a, a span of a number of years, and it went dark uh, sometime in 2016. And we don't really know why it went dark. Some of the rumors on the internet is there's a, a, a suspect that um, the people, the original authors behind that network may have been arrested. But we really don't know why it went dark. One of the things that was interesting about CryptoWall and this, sim this, this similarity exists in all the modern families of ransomware, is that there were certain countries that the ransomware would look to see which origin the computer was in, and if it decided or knew that it was in Russia or Kazakhstan or Ukraine or the, the countries on this list, it wouldn't execute. Uh, it wouldn't encrypt the files. 
And so that gave us some clues to potentially the origins of the authors of the, you know, these different ransomware families. So this is a typical flow um, of what ransomware would do once it's infected. So imagine an employee at work uh, receives an email, and I have a few samples of the phishing emails that are distributing this ransomware. Um, they click links, and their computer gets infected. What it'll then do is that ransomware is programmed to go and communicate with proxy servers that the attackers control or have compromised. And what those proxy servers do is they're the bridge to the Onion routing network or the Tor network. So your, the infected computer doesn't have a direct link to the dark net. Um, so what the attackers have to do is have that ransomware connect to that PHP proxy. And usually it's a hacked Drupal or WordPress site or some Linux control panel that was unmanned. Uh, and then that would have software on it that would route the connection to the Tor network uh, in order to get instructions and to get retrieve the decryp decryption key once the payment has been verified. So keep that uh, flow in mind. Employee gets infected. It reaches out to a pre-configured list of domains and IP addresses um, that would then relay that connection to Tor so that the victim would get instructions and, and on how to retrieve a decryption key. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, CryptoWall, we first saw versions of it in 2013. And here's a very typical, here's a, a example of a phishing email that was distributing that. And what you'll notice is the phishing email isn't terribly cunning. It's, hey, respected customer, uh, here's an invoice if you want to, that you owe. We've attached it in a zip file. Um, and usually inside of that zip file, there'll be some sort of JavaScript or some office document with a macro uh, that would start the infection of the, com uh, of the computer. What I find fascinating about this is here we are in 2016, and the attackers are still using variants of the same phishing stories. It's you've received the fax, you've received an invoice, um, you've received a voicemail, you've, someone sent you a file from a network attached scanner, and they keep reusing the same phishing stories over and over again. Um, so once uh, someone opens up that zip file, there'll usually be something inside of it um, that's a JavaScript file that's usually executed and ran by Windows scripting host. And that will contain the instructions of how to reach out to that compromised proxy server. Um, once it does that and it verifies that it's online, it'll start encrypting the files. Um, so, so, and it'll do that in the background until it feels like it's encrypted enough files to either spawn a pop-up to notify the victim, or in some cases the victim will just find the ransom text file or help file in the folder that they're looking for. Um, early days, it was just a text file, but they began to start to stylize this one. Now, if you can't read German, that's okay, but essentially, in this case, you know, it's explaining to the victim what ransomware is, telling them that they're going to have to pay some sort of ransom. Usually, the ransom is about one Bitcoin. That is changing, though, in some other uh, new ransomware families. A few months ago, a Bitcoin would have cost you, I believe, somewhere around $150. Um, that uh, the price of Bitcoin, especially with uh, uh, Britain exiting uh, the EU, is actually quite high now. Um, it's approaching $500. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, CryptoWall has gone dark, and there hasn't been much activity from what I'm going to call the godfather or the, the originator of this sort of piece of malware that we all know today as ransomware. So I'm going to talk about another one called Tesla Crypt. And there, it's still in the wild. We still see active samples of it. Um, it increased its, uh, its abilities with encryption, so it's using a key with length of a higher value. Um, it's had bugs, and many researchers have disclosed those bugs. And the authors watch these disclosures, and they version it, and they put different versions out. Um, it's usually dispersed via well-known exploit kits and, and other different uh, phishing campaigns. But what's important for the audience today to know is even though the majority of ransomware is distributed via phishing, it doesn't have to be. Once someone on the dark net gets and purchases a ransomware kit, um, if they're good at phishing and they have email infrastructure and they can send out high volumes of phishing emails, they, they generally will. 
but some of them don't have that capability and so what they'll do is they'll use different instant messaging platforms in order to send links to different ransomware downloaders. So while the majority of ransomware is distributed via phishing emails, it can be distributed via different chat platforms, uh, Facebook chat, a LinkedIn message, or something to that effect as well. Um, what was fascinating as our researchers watched TeslaCrypt is the rate of development and the different versions that they were able to put out rapidly in response to um, different uh, researchers finding problems in TeslaCrypt. So they really upped their game in order to continue to add features and functionalities to TeslaCrypt. Um, and this kind of speaks to the rise into the sophistication of the people behind this. They're, they're starting to operate ransomware as really a professional software development firm. Um, with bug fixes, with QA testing, with rapid releases. So, like I mentioned earlier, Tesla Crypt is still very active. Um, we did see kind of a spike in March. It is trailing. Um, there are a number of other uh, ransomware families that are starting to take its place. So it's beginning to die down uh, as far as the activity of it. The, the way that uh, it interacts is very similar. Once someone's infected, it then reaches out to uh, another attacker-controlled host that they've compromised that will have the proxy needed to get that connection over into the onion routing uh, darknet. And like I mentioned earlier, even though um, this is one of the later versions of ransomware, they're still using the very similar uh, types of phishing emails to distribute it. So this is an example of a phishing email um, that was distributing Tesla Crypt, and it's basically saying, hey, you've received some money. Everyone would like to receive some money, right? So go ahead and uh, open up this zip file in order to learn how to process your transaction. Uh, when the computer's infected, they don't get necessarily as nice of a screen on Tesla, Tesla Crypt. It's kind of just this black and white screen, but it's very much uh, the same in you know, explaining to the victim what's happened, uh, letting them know what the payment's going to be, and giving them some websites that they can go to in order to process the payment. Now, the attacker fully expects that the websites that they have online will go offline. So one of the things that's common in almost all those ransomware campaigns is they're going to put, to put together usually a list of four to five URLs. This sample has three um, that the victim can interact with just in case one of them gets taken offline uh, during the middle of their campaign. Um, what's interesting about ransomware authors, and I get this question a lot, is, well, if I pay the ransom, will they decrypt my files? Um, or will they just take my money and run? And one of the, what I explain to people is these, these crimeware authors, they're operating this as a business. Um, they can't have bad customer service, word of mouth, getting out there on the Internet that, hey, I, I paid the ransom, and they, they didn't decrypt the files. So, yes, in, in every case, um, when, when you do pay the ransom, you are able to decrypt the files because they can't have word of mouth getting out that uh, people are just taking the money and run. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk about another variant of ransom, and this kind of really starts to speak to where this crimeware industry is headed, uh, and that's Locky. Um, so Locky is, is a very popular uh, strain right now, as well as a, a, a cousin of it called Cerber, which we're going to get a demo of later today. Again, it's spread via phishing emails, usually Microsoft documents that have macros enabled. And those macros, uh, th that document, when the employee opens it up, it's going to have an arrow that says, hey, if you want to look at this document, you're going to have to click Enable Macros. And they'll usually point to the Enable Macro button. And once the victim does that, it'll start to uh, infect the system. Now, what was fascinating about Locky compared to these earlier families of ransomware is this addition of something called an affiliate ID. And like I mentioned earlier, the different actors in, uh, in crimeware and underground circles, some of them have specialties in perhaps compromising WordPress sites so they can build those proxy servers to the, the Onion routing network easily. Some of them have expertise in delivering high volumes of malicious uh, phishing emails, so they're good at mail infrastructure. Um, so, and so depending on your expertise, you might actually become an affiliate. And so if you have the 
way to send high volumes of email, you'll log, you'll get an affiliate ID, and you'll do your part of the ransomware delivery. And depending on your contribution, you get paid out accordingly. So it's almost democratizing and, and, and enabling the idea of subcontractors in the underground community um, so that they can work on their area of expertise. Uh, again, this is just an example of them upgrading their sophistication and their organization uh, in order to infect people in mass. And I really think this is contributing to the big surge in volume that we're, rece that we're monitoring right now in ransomware. Um, what's kind of interesting about Locky is it shares very similar uh, code and, and methodologies with a banking trojan called Drydex. It was very popular in 20, 2014 and 15. And what this banking trojan would do is it would insert itself in between the browser and the banks and it would usually throw an SSL warning that a lot of people would click through um, and it would it would collect banking credentials. Well, somewhere probably near the end of 2015, the authors of Drydex realized, hey, compromising bank accounts, it's getting more difficult, especially with multi-factor authentication. Wouldn't it be just easier if we can get the victims to send us money directly? And so that seems to be what they did. They just shifted gears from this banking trojan that they created in order to make it a prime distributor of the Locky uh, ransomware. And they have an affiliate ID in order to do that. Um, here's the victim map for Locky. And you'll notice it's pretty much all across the board, except there's a big chunk over there in uh, Asia and Eastern Europe and Russia that's not infected. And like I mentioned earlier in cryptoware, the ransomware was uh, region aware and it would not infect certain countries that it was hard encoded uh, to not do so. And so that tradition seems to have carried on. And that might continue to give us some clues to where these threat actors are um, operating from. Maybe they feel like if they actually get arrested and they are able to show that they didn't victimize any of their fellow citizens that uh, the judges will be more lenient on them. Uh, but here we are again, you know, very, in 2016, and there's not much ingenuity or thought that's going into the phishing emails that's distributing ransomware. Um, this one is Locky being distributed by an invoice, so a phishing email that's meant to look like an invoice. Um, this is what happens when they're infected. So again, they get instructions and places to go on what they need to do next. Um, so. Um, that's pretty much the state of the union. There is one new variant of ransomware that uh, was really just discovered within the past couple weeks um, that, uh, that we're publishing some details about on ransomware.fishme.com that doesn't have a command and control infrastructure. And what it's doing is it's just zipping all the files in a password encrypted zip file and then giving the, the person a website to go to to get instructions. So again, it's just to, to show us that the attackers are changing uh, as, as we are continuing to improve our defenses. Um, but this is really a, a speaks to the rise of ransomware as a service, especially now that we have this concept of affiliate IDs and different crime actors really working on their specialty and their piece of the pie as when it comes uh, to ransomware. Another interesting thing that we're seeing in the incident response community is we'll have advanced actors that are compromising big corporate networks. And after they've you know, finished their espionage and stolen all the documents that they need to, oftentimes before they leave, almost in a scorched earth attempt, they will install ransomware on the systems that they've been on in order to, what I'd say, divert the computer forensics and incident response team to make that company think that they have a ransomware outbreak breach when really it was something that was more serious. So it's ransomware being used to cover tracks of corporate uh, intrusions. Um, just some future work that the FishMe research team is working on, might be interesting for you guys to know, is I, what happens when you pay for the ransom? That's a very good question. Um, your files are decrypted, but what we have found is interesting is the ransomware agent remains active on the computer and continues to speak and talk out to the attacker's infrastructure. And we really don't know what will happen. Um, so 
if people are paying the ransom to get their files back, that's one thing. But they absolutely must need to clean their computer or potentially rebuild it because leaving that agent on the system isn't a good strategy. In fact, we've gone so far as to pay the ransom on five lab systems uh, for five different families of ransomware that we're tracking uh, to, to monitor whether or not the attackers come back in or if we get reinfected again. And so that will be a topic for a future research paper that we end up publishing. Um, like I said, the problem is getting much worse, and there are a multitude, a multitude of ways that we need to really get at this. Um, I mentioned the steps, and probably at this point, it would be a good idea. I've, I've talked a lot about it, but it'd be a great idea if we can show you some live ransomware in action. All right, great. Aaron, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm just going to grab the controls here. Sure. All right. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, one second here. There we go. Okay, so um, now for our demo, and this is the first part of our demo, we're going to have uh, uh, a few things here that we want to show. Um, Aaron went over a lot of stuff really quickly, uh, a lot of great information, and um, you know, usually I'm a visual person, and so I like to see things visually as well. Um, I, I, I have a, a host over here, as you guys can probably see, uh, and I'm going to do a few things to it here, and I want to take it step by step. Uh, so uh, we went through and we talked about a, a lot of stages of the ransomware, of how it gets infected, how it gets distributed, and um, it, you know, it sounds like these guys went from being you know the crook that kicks in the door to organized crime. You know, these guys are you know the most sophisticated mafia out there uh, working together. Everybody plays the role uh, in order to uh, get out there, infect us, and, and steal as much as they can from us and as fast as they can. Um, so over here, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I have this host, and um, this host is protected. So um, I'm going to use this tool called shieldtest.com. And uh, what this tool does is just quickly goes through and does a quick uh, uh, scan, if you will. Uh, so right now it's just going through doing a port, uh, a port scan on my external IP address, and then it's doing a, a mini DOS attack just to see if there is uh, any kind of DOS prevention there. Uh, right after that, it's going to take a malware sample, try to download it from the internet to this computer over here to see if there is a gateway antivirus trying to block that. It'll do the same thing with an infected zip file, then it'll check for IPS. And so it does a client side attack, then it does a server side attack over here, it does a SQL injection. And after that, it'll go through and uh, it'll uh, try to upload uh, four sample credit card numbers to see if there's a DLP that blocks it. So as you can see here, everything's pretty much being blocked. Um, we're passing all these tests, so we, we are protected. Um, we're behind my digital shield over here, and I uh, can learn more about how that uh, how that protects uh, uh, the systems or how it protects your network. Uh, but what I want to do is um, got my Facebook open up over here, and I happen to get a uh, message over here from Ruth saying, "Hey, check this out," and it's something bestmovie.mov. Huh, sounds interesting. I know Ruth. Going to check this out. And I go and click on that link, and all of a sudden I get this block page. So there's a couple things I wanted to point out here. Uh, we bypassed a few of the first stages here. right? So first of all, um, normally you would have some kind of anti-spam um, or antivirus system or something on, uh, on your email. So since we use Facebook, we bypassed that first layer of protection. And hopefully that first layer of protection, if you have, uh, if, you know, if it's, a, if it's a type of spam email that would get recognized, hopefully that is your first line of defense. In this case, we bypassed it. So the other thing that I want to point out is, uh, if you notice over here, the link is actually an IP address, and it's not a domain name. So this is important for, for a couple of reasons. The first one is, if you're relying solely on something like uh, DNS sync holding, for example, um, you know, this is a system that would go out and use a DNS server that does the filtering, um, uh, you know, for you using DNS. Well, that would completely bypass that DNS sinkhole, and because it's using an IP address, 
and not a DNS name. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is this. So if I if I go in here and I say, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why am I blocked? You know, what kind of website is this? And I just try to go to the main website. Well, well wait, I can get to this website, right? It says great website. Wow, what a great website. It's like, okay, Ruth sent this to me. Um, you, you know, I know Ruth. And, and it's trying to tell me that it's, uh, I'm looking at this and it's a normal website, right? But why am I getting blocked over here? You know, what are you doing in my digital shield? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the My Digital Shield Cloud Manager, and I'm actually going to whitelist the site and go, okay, you know what? Whatever. I don't believe it's a bad site. I am going to whitelist it. So I just went through and whitelisted. it. So let me just go over here again and try to download this movie. So as I click on it, you'll notice I get blocked again. So what's going on here? So I by, bypassed another layer of defense, which is web filtering, right? And I'm looking over here and going, okay, I'm getting blocked again. What's going on? So it says, high security alert. You're not permitted to download the file bestmovie.mov because it is infected with a virus. So you can see here, here's the name of the virus. This is a crypto wall right here. I'm like, okay, how can this be? Um, I, I don't believe it. So I'm one of those users that is very persistent and wants to bypass yet another defense mechanism here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to go. Okay, you know what? Somehow I got this best movie down to my computer. I was able to download it, and now I'm going to click on it and open it up. Excellent! I got this movie. Now I'm going to watch it. All of a sudden, it doesn't open. I'm like, okay, what's going on there? How come this movie is not opening? So um, the next thing I'd probably do as a user is go, uh, okay, wait a minute. Um, let me try to send this to somebody that has maybe more access. And maybe I'd send it to an administrator or somebody and go, um, hey, administrator, can you, uh, uh, can you try to open this movie for me? I'm having trouble opening it. And then that administrator probably has access to all the network drives and everything else, uh, you know, which would further infect uh, that, that file over there. Um, in the meantime, an alert similar to this one right here would go out going, wait a minute, there is crypto wall on your network. As we scroll down and look, okay, my digital shield's blocking it. Here's the host IP address. Um, here's the name of the computer. Uh, we're blocking it, but it's infected. You know, here's the steps you need to take in order to clean it. Now, the majority of you will probably take this email alert and uh, uh, stick it into a PSA system and uh, provide, open up a ticket uh, within your organization so somebody could take care of this before it gets further out of control. I don't have a PSA system, so I'm just using that email alert here. Uh, so anyway, so as you see here, I executed the file. It's blocking it, and I want to show specifically um, in my documents over here, I have this document called test.txt that I've been working on so diligently uh, over here trying to type this out. This is a test, and nothing's happened to it. It hasn't gotten infected yet because we're blocking it. Uh, so at this stage, everything's being blocked because we are blocking the command and control uh, going up from, uh, from this virus, from, from CryptoWall. Uh, but I could take it a step further and try to, you know, try to explore more and see if we can like, for instance, if I took the laptop off a network or something else, and as soon as it started communicating, then it could start encrypting. Uh, but before I go any further over here, what I wanted to do is take it to the next level of defense. So here's what we cover. You know, you, you want to block your spam emails whenever they, they have uh, any, any kind of attachment in it or if they have any kind of link in there. If you click on a link, you want to make sure you have good web filtering, uh, not just something that's DNS-based, but something that's, that's a little bit more in-depth. Um, you know, uh, one of the things Aaron mentioned is a lot of the malware is is housed on legitimate web servers out there. It's not just bad web servers. So, uh, you know, as I pointed out, this is the best website or this is a great website. That is a legitimate website, but somehow it got hacked and the malware is on there. So you want to have a good web filter and they'll be able to block that. On top of that, you want to have good gateway antivirus that's going to, if you're downloading that virus, is going to be able to block that as well. And then on top of that, you want to have something that's going to block that command and control uh, for that communication going outbound. So these, this is kind of the defense in depth. And uh, you heard Aaron say that the, some of the newer uh, ransomware, it's aware of these different stages. And what it's trying to do is target those who are only 
uh, using one method of defense or, or maybe two methods of defense and trying to, like for instance, it will, uh, the new ransomware set does not have any C2 communication. It just zips up your files. So it's trying to just target those who are only using something that, that blocks that uh, C2 communication. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now is we're going to look at the, the next level of defense. And the next level of defense, so right now I'm actually infected with CryptoWall. It is on my computer over here. It's just not encrypting any files because it cannot communicate. So what, what do you do at this stage? The best way to do it is to have the best backup system in the world. And question for all of you out there, what is the best backup and disaster recovery system out there in the world? Crickets. Do we leave every, everybody on mute or something? All right, Dan, I, help I, us I, out there. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd have to chime in and say that um, my, my, my best guess is that that would be Datto. Um, Datto provides disaster recovery and business continuity solutions, both hardware and software, to um, literally about a, over a million endpoints. Uh, we have 200 petabytes of data in our cloud uh, worldwide. So we're protecting it, just a vast amount of, uh, of data. And it was funny because we, one of the things data is known for is, uh, is our, our infamous disaster demos where we show a device being lit on fire or being plunged into liquid nitrogen. That disaster demo has evolved to really uh, revolve around ransomware because that is the number one disaster that most people face these days. It used to be that uh, dis uh, disaster recovery and backup software was was a just-in-case scenario, like in case a facility burnt down or in case uh, there was, you know, uh, a, an electrical surge. But the reality is nowadays it's a it's a it's a weekly activity for most IT people to be able to deal with some form of ransomware. And while uh, you know Andrew and Aaron talked about the uh, you know the the importance of uh, an ounce of prevention, uh, when you're already infected, a pound of cure is actually uh, well well needed and well deserved. So what I'm going to walk you through is a scenario for you know how a, a given user could deal with um, with uh, getting back into productivity in the event that they did have um, some form of ransomware or malware uh, infection. Um, just want to confirm, Andrew, you can see my screen at this point? Yes, yeah, we can see it. Great. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is, and now that I know that I, I, I've gotten an indication that I'm, I'm infected, um, I actually want to figure out uh, what was the point that infection occurred. And I'm going to use a tool called Backup Insights. So Backup Insights, what it allows me to do is sort of go back in time and look at the different uh, snapshots, the different uh, states of my system um, throughout the history of its backup. So uh, what I'm going to do is I just happen to know, because I'm clever, I set up my demo yesterday, that I, my system was clean at 348 yesterday. Um, and uh, at, at a, and so I'll be able to show you what someone would be able to detect. What I'm doing now is I'm assembling the system as it looked at those two points. We use block level backup, not file backup. So I don't have to worry about past versions of, of documents getting infected um, because essentially what we've done is we've broken down the elements of, uh, of the files and I'm reassembling them in the event that I need them. So I'm going to scroll down here to my important data folder. Uh, because that's where stuff is housed. Just to give you an example, this is a poor man's simulation. I'm not actually infected with Locky, but this is similar to what a Locky infection would look like, where all of my file names, as they existed, uh, you know, yesterday at, at 3:48, have all of a sudden been turned into these strings of, of letters and numbers and been given a dot Locky extension. That tells me that, yeah, in fact. Um, I, I have been uh, infected by Locky. It's very clear. Um, I'm no longer able to find those those files. So great, I've I've identified my last good backup. And again, I need to get to productivity. So wh what we also what we do provide from then is is multiple uh, ways to get back to productivity. So it might be simply the fact that I need to get to a given file. Um, I'm about to do a presentation. Um, I need to get to that PowerPoint. Sure, it'd be great to get to my system all clean and wonderful, but why, why don't I just get that PowerPoint onto a clean uh, PC and get on with my day? 
in that case, what I can do is I can do a simple file restore. And so what I have here is I have an example of one of my systems with a file restore. And I'm going to go in here. And so what I've done is I have uh, I've created this file restore. And I can go through a web interface. And I can actually browse through the file structure, you know, get to that file that I need, download it to a machine that I need, download entire directories, download uh, individual files, and get back to productivity. So, so I'm able to continue my business. I'm not halted by the fact that um, I have this infected system. So that's sort of my my stage one is I can just get to productivity by retrieving individual files. But my next step is I actually need a system. Um, I can't just uh, I can't just work with that one file. Again, let's let's pretend that I've got a system, uh, this D Flanagan PC system. Let's say that that's my finance system. It's got QuickBooks on it. I need to get invoices out. I can't live without that machine. Uh, it's not good enough to just get files. In that case, what I can do is I can create a local virtualization. And what I can do is I can go back again to that recovery, my last good recovery point that I discovered with Backup Insights, and I can start my virtualization. And I can go ahead and I can start this VM. And again, because this is block level backup, what I'm doing is I'm assembling a picture of what the system looked at that point in time. I don't have to worry that this version is infected. I don't have to worry that this version could be infected. I'm assembling sort of an, a temporary virtualization that I can work in in order to get my work done. And I can connect via RDP. And I can go in and I can get productive on this system. Now, I know that this system's got to get some updates applied, so I don't want to sit here and watch Windows do updates, so I'm going to close this. But again, assuming that that system uh, had been uh, updated at the time of the backup, um, I can go in and again, I can, I can start to get productive right away. So that allows me the ability, again, to get uh, the, the whole point of disaster recovery and business continuity versus plain backup is the idea that I need uh, productivity most businesses can't afford to slow down. I can't afford a day of, oh, we've got to go rebuild all your machines. I need these bridges such as file restores, such as temporary virtualizations. But at that point in which I'm ready to go and rebuild, uh, I have further uh, capabilities. So I can do a bare metal restore. And with bare metal restore, what that allows me to do is to go and re-image that uh, that machine back again to that point in time where I had my last good backup so that I can go and build a machine that I know has no traces of that uh, of that uh, uh, that ransomware on it um, as as Aaron was talking about you know that even if you pay the ransomware um, if you're not doing something about removing it who knows what's going to happen at some point in the future um, the, the, the bare metal restore provides me the ability to get back to a clean point in time. Um, and the, the great thing, of, I mean, if there's one good saving grace about the, the ransomware today is that it tend, it's not acting like a long-term Trojan horse. It's tending to act immediately. Um, so you're able to get, you have a minimum amount of time where you know, potentially data might be, might, might be lost. So again, in my cases, my last good backup was yesterday at 4 p.m. Sure, I have a day's worth of stuff I might have done that might not be any good or my, I might have to work to recreate, but at least I've got that last good backup and I can continue on with my way. So again, kind of recap, um, I need the ability to quickly identify where my last good backup was. I need the ability to uh, identify, uh, capture individual files so I can be productive. I need the ability to virtualize machines so that I can uh, continue with work while I work on my, my full restore. And then I need that ability to get back to a full restore so that I can completely purge my system of any traces of, uh, of that ransomware and know that I can move forward in confidence. So I know I crashed through the system pretty quickly here. Um, but I think that gives a pretty good overview of, in the event that I wasn't able to prevent my problems, at least I can get back to productivity fairly quickly.
Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dan. And actually, uh, we had a lot of good questions here. Um, and uh, one of the ones, uh, and, and maybe this is, uh, uh, you know, I, I kind of asked you, what's what's the best uh, uh, BDR out there? And uh, I think most of the audience agrees with you that Datto is by far the best. But um, uh, just to kind of, uh, not necessarily put you on the spot, but since we have Aaron here, uh, you, you know, I, I'd like to ask him, you know, is there is there a difference, right? Somebody's asking, like I heard there's ransomware like like Lockheed that will actually encrypt backups, right? So is there a difference of using a system like Datto that is a full BDR versus a, a simple backup? And is there ransomware that can, uh, you know, really mess up your backup so that if you're using some, you know, not a, a good elaborate backup system but something very simple that it'll actually delete those backups or it'll do something to them and, and affect them as well? And I think maybe you touched on this again, but maybe uh, Aaron would be good to reiterate that. Sure, sure. I mean, as, like I mentioned, the, uh, ransomware continues to add capabilities. And so, um, for instance, you know, you have a lot of these systems that are just doing kind of snapshotting of files. And a lot of them are configured to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep five versions of a file. I'm going to keep four versions of a file. Um, and so... Uh, some of the more insidious pieces of ransomware will actually take that file and then rename it, name it back, rename it, name it back, and it'll loop through the number of iterations. It's making the best guess at what type of backup software that you might have in order to defeat uh, software that's only, take, only backing up a specific number of versions. Um, so that's uh, a capability that's been added, and I suspect more things like that are going to continue to uh, enter into di the different ransomware families. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so um, it definitely makes sense to have a, a solid BDR system, and, and you know, as I mentioned, um, it seems like everybody here agrees, and, and uh, you know, Dan, very excellent demo, you know, it's uh, probably the best uh, um, backup solution that I've seen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a backup person. Uh, but uh, definitely a better thing I've seen out there. It's uh, extremely impressive. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, one of the other things that uh, uh, that Aaron um, mentioned is we're going to do a, another demo on server. So uh, server is very interesting. Let me uh, just share my screen here. Server is a very interesting uh, um, type of ransomware. Uh, because it does one of those things that Aaron mentioned. So it, there's actually two things that it does. Uh, number one is it'll actually go through and uh, uh, check to see if if you're somewhere in, in Russia or the uh, Eastern Europe. And the other thing it'll do is it'll wait a few seconds, or it'll wait about 30 seconds or so uh, to see if, uh, uh, it, the reason why it does that is it tries to avoid detection. It, it checks to see if it's you're in a sandbox, right? So it, typically a sandbox will spin up It'll execute this. It'll detect what will happen, and then it'll uh, it'll go away, right? And if, if it goes away within 30 seconds, nothing happens. Bam! This is safe, and it passes it along. Uh, so it's a little bit more intelligent, and this is kind of like as Aaron mentioned, uh, ransomware is getting more intelligent. The malware is getting more intelligent to try to avoid detection. Uh, so one thing we do here, we're going to do here is uh, um, again my uh, my test file over here, which is still safe. Um, I went through and uh, I disabled. The security on here, so I'm just going to run this test really quick here, uh, just to show that uh, I, I disabled most of the uh, MDS security uh, uh, stuff that's available. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually execute a uh, server, and and we're going to do it so that MDS is not blocking it. But what we're going to do is, if you notice here, I actually enabled the Russian keyboard over here. Now this is something. Uh, the reason why I did this is I want the server to think that I am actually in Russia. Now, I don't have to use the Russian keyboard. I'm still using the English keyboard, but I want it to think that I'm in Russia, so uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm actually just have it enabled here. Uh, now, going back to this, so you can see I, I uh, failed most of the tests here, not fully protected, and I'm going to go and execute this. Now, as I mentioned, it actually sits there, it disappears, first thing it does, and then it, it waits for a little bit. Now, one of the things it does is it checks, hey, do, I, do you have the Russian keyboard enabled? Now, after about 30 seconds here, if I'm infected, it should go through and actually change this file, encrypt it. You'll have a bunch of stuff come up here. You'll have a, you'll have a bunch of uh, ransom type stuff come up and say, hey, you're, you're infected. You know, you got to pay this amount of money. Um, 
Aaron, just any more details on some of these evasion techniques that uh, you know about that uh, some of these ransomware use? Yeah, some of them will look at the MAC address of your network card to see if it begins with the octets that indicate that it's in a virtual machine, so VMware. Um, you know, oftentimes the authors, they don't want different reverse engineers looking or poking around too closely at their uh, files. Another thing that it'll do sometimes to detect if it's in a virtual machine is it'll wait for mouse movement because most sandboxes don't move the mouse. They just execute everything. Another tactic that we've seen in various ransomware families is it'll wait for the victim to go to websites um, just to kind of make sure that it has a real human on the end of the keyboard and, and it's not trapped in a virtual machine or sandbox. And like I said, n none of these features existed in the early forms of ransomware out the gate. These are capabilities that have been added to and expanded upon across the years here. Okay, excellent. So, um, as you see here, nothing's really happened. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go in and uh, disable the the Russian language pack there in uh, the regional settings. So we're going to apply that. And as you see here, that uh, that kind of went away. Um, now, uh, as soon as you run server, it actually deletes the file itself. So I do have a backup copy, luckily, here. And I'm going to uh, bring that up here. Let me just copy it back to the desktop here. And I'm going to execute it. So really, the only thing that changed is I changed that um, the keyboard system there. So again, uh, same thing, right? It went through and disappeared, deleted itself over there, and it's waiting a few minutes. So uh, once it waits a few minutes, then uh, then it's going to start executing. So uh, nothing's really changed here except that that bit, that little piece over here. Um, again, I got the security disabled on my digital shield, so an EC2 communication would not be blocked. It'd be going through at this point. Uh, and uh, this usually takes probably about a minute, and as Aaron mentioned, there's there's different things that can happen here that uh, various ransomware does to make sure that it is a human, uh, you know, such as the web browsing, um, et cetera, mouse movements, and everything else. Um, I think that, like, sandboxing, I remember hearing about this, and this is supposed to be, like, the next phase of security. And this is what's going to catch everything. And I was really amazed how quickly something like sandboxing, uh, you know, really became, it's, it's not really obsolete, but became uh, one of these things that uh, malware worked around really, really quickly. You know, uh, to, it, it's, it's uh, again, something that's systematic, and it goes to show over and over again that you have to have that human intervention. You know, you, gotta, you have to have that, uh, uh, the humans looking at it, the humans uh, uh, analyzing it, and being able to, uh, uh, you know, being able to do threat intelligence on it properly. All right, Andrew, so. I think, I think uh, you know, one of the things is that the, the malware doesn't have to be 100%, right? If they, if, they're, if they work 50% of the time, they're happy, but your protection has to work 100% of the time. There's no option of it not, you know, if their server doesn't work on your particular machine, so be it. It'll work on the next one. Right. You're absolutely right. Okay, so we have infection over here. Um, as you see, all of a sudden, bam, I got this uh, HTML file open up saying I am infected. Um, of course, my documents over here no longer have my uh, very elaborate uh, uh, file that I was working on. Uh, and I uh, got a bunch of stuff on my desktop over here. So now that I am well infected and uh, I'm with the with server over here, um, we have no choice but to restore using Datto. Um, so uh, at this point, I, I know we have a lot of questions going through there, and uh, I don't know, um, Eric or, or Ruth or, or Dan, if you guys were looking through the questions, is there any specific questions you want to point out that uh, maybe you want to address? I like this. I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> I think uh, 
Um, Aaron, you made it so appealing that anybody now who doesn't have to write code, they could just go out there and buy a ransomware kit and make a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, get your affiliate ID and you're good to go. It's just like uh, uh, selling Mary Kay makeup. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, so one of the questions that came through um, was about yeah, how do I how does how does Datto stop ransomware from encrypting the backup? Um, it, it really has to do with the way we uh, we build our backup chain. Um, we uh, that there's there's no way for uh, the the um, the Locky virus to actually be active on our backup device. Um, that, that's one of the benefits of not just doing a file copy um, is that we're essentially breaking down the files as uh, into blocks in order to um, uh, in order to write them to the data device. And in doing so, it effectively means that uh, there's no way for any any of that those files. There's no execution capability available. So any of those pre uh, infection uh, iterations or versions can be assembled with absolutely no interaction with the uh, with the the corruption. So um, that that is uh, that that's basically how we make sure that that you can't uh, that the backup uh, can never be uh, uh, can never be corrupted. Okay, excellent. And uh, uh, there was a question here about. Uh, about Mac and Linux. I know most of the of the focus has been around uh, Windows, but uh, Aaron, maybe you can uh, address that if you guys are seeing anything around Mac and Linux with ransomware. Sure, not so much Linux, but there there is a small family that uh, can infect OS X. The infections aren't as prevalent, um, not because it's a, a superior architecture, but you know, for for these uh, crime syndicates, this is a numbers game, and so when they put all the effort into you know, standing up infrastructure to send phishing emails to compromising web hosts to proxy under the dark net. They want to profit from that as much as they can. And so the types of emails that they're going to send out are going to assume that the victims are going to be Windows just because there's, you know, more market penetration of Windows operating systems out there. So while, yes, in theory, those other platforms can be compromised, and we might see an uptick in that. In fact, we're starting to see small families um, attack web servers so they'll encrypt content of your WordPress blog in a similar way and expect the ransom to decrypt it. But by far, the, the vast major, overwhelming majority of infections and the, of, are Windows-based. And for, the, for like I said, the reason is because that's where they know the money is. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and imagine if we all started to shift to something else, then the infections would start to shift to something else because that's where the money would be again. Um, and so I saw a question over there uh, around uh, the tool that I used, uh, which, which is Shield Test over here, and I just kind of wanted to quickly show this. Um, so uh, Shield Test, it's it's a pretty simple tool. You can go there, ShieldTest.com, and this tool is actually the way it was developed uh, was with MSPs in mind. Um, you could you could find out more if you just uh, I'll have an email up there later. Info at mydigitalshield.com. You could actually get this tool set up that it would be. Uh, branded with with your logo and have all your information and everything, so it's kind of be your tool. It's really meant to for MSPs and uh, IT providers to go out there and leverage this tool to educate their customers, to show them, um, you know, hey, what level of protection they're having and what really level of protection they need uh, from a perimeter security perspective. Uh, uh, and yeah, and it's it's a pretty simple tool. Um, Let's see, any other questions out there? I don't know, Dan or Aaron, if you guys have been, uh, if you're looking there, I, we're, I know we're running out of time, maybe we could just do one more question. Aaron, maybe you could go a little bit over Fish Me, um, and uh, if, if people wanted to learn more about it. Uh, sure, absolutely. I, I, I love this panel because um, you absolutely need the best technical defense, but we, we recognize that the, the attackers are changing, and so there's nothing that's perfect. We gotta do our best there. Um, that's why we need backups because employees are going to make mistakes and they're going to open up emails that they're not supposed to. What FishMe is most known for is we look at this as a behavior problem, not a security awareness problem. Your employees are aware that there are phishing emails that can infect their uh, system, but they're going through emails at such a rapid rate that they just don't have the tools yet or the training to uh, 
tune that behavior to identify those suspicious indicators in email. So what FishMe is most widely known for is our phishing simulation platform uh, that companies use to simulate real phishing attacks against their employees. And as soon as they fall victim to it, uh, they're shown a brief bite-sized bit of training, uh, just reminding them of what the threat is and what they could have uh, spotted in that email to help them identify that. Because we recognize, just like Dato, that the attackers are always going to be changing their tactics and something's going to happen. And so we just can't always rely on technology defenses that we have to get our humans roped into this to help defend our, our network systems. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And, and I know there's a lot of questions about uh, partner programs, MSP pricing, and everything else. Um, I did put a slide up here which gives uh, some contact information, email, and as well as web address. Uh, if you would, just shoot a quick email and uh, we can help answer the rest of your questions. We're, we're well over time now. Um, I just want to thank everybody uh, here on this webinar for coming and uh, um, you, you know watching the anatomy of a ransomware. Hopefully this has been extremely helpful that you learned a little bit more about how ransomware functions uh, and especially the processes within it that what we call the kill chain, places where you can uh, you know insert defenses to block and prevent um, you know the ransomware from infecting your your, your customers. Um, I especially want to thank Aaron. Thank you so much for, for joining us here and, and helping out and educating all of us on uh, ransomware, on where it is today and where it's going. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, Dan, also, thank you very much. I really pre appreciate you spending the time. And uh, I know it's a little bit last minute for you, but thank you for, for doing the demo and uh, uh, you know talking about the, uh, the, the data solution and how it's that last line of defense and very much needed because uh, if everything else fails, and as, as, as Aaron showed and talked about, um, these guys sit there and try to do everything they can to work around your defenses. This is kind of that last line of defense that is very much needed. Uh, and I appreciate uh, you spending the time and doing the demo here as well. Thank you very much, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.